two chapters today, and that is Spinner's End and Will and Won't. Um, the interesting sort of... it's a switch between who we're following, really with all three of the first chapters, uh, and then by the third chapter we sort of get into our normal uh, following Harry narrative. But between Spinner's End and Will and Won't, we actually have a rather interesting development. That is, in theory, what these chapters should be doing is sort of laying out to uh, us as readers the sides of the war that we're looking at. Um, and, and sort of showing us, yeah, okay, so the Death Eaters have consolidated, and the Order of the Phoenix have consolidated, and that's not actually what's happening at all. Spinner's End is distinctly this sort of covert revolution happening under the Dark Lord's nose with, with some of his followers. Uh, and then we see in Will and Won't sort of a, a something similar on Dumbledore's side. So let me sort of lay this out for you. This set of chapters, instead of giving us sort of this is the bad guys and this is the good guys, we are getting a distinct sense of loyalty and where loyalty lies. But it's oddly enough not with Voldemort and Dumbledore. Each of our characters is showing moments of doubt, moments of reacting against this tendency to coalesce to either side and polarize. Let's start, of course, with Spinner's End, since that does come first. We have a very interesting, very cinematic sort of introduction to um, the entrance of Narcissa and Bellatrix who we're seeing not as maniacal, terrible human beings, but we're seeing as, like, sisters who are concerned about each other. And a fox dies, so we, we can see sort of how Trigger Bellatrix is. Uh, but she, oddly enough, actually displays some doubt in Voldemort as a person. Uh, when she says that she believes Voldemort is mistaken about Snape's loyalties. And this is coming from the person who, throughout the rest of the chapter, is presented as one of Voldemort's most loyal, like, right-hand people who made some mistakes and so is sort of out of favor, but we're not quite expect having expected this doubt from Bellatrix. But it's there. Narcissa, we get a really clear view of while well, she is sort of leaning towards Voldemort, her loyalty really lies with her family. Like, she doesn't defend the Dark Lord with Bellatrix's I don't think he's right, or really anything that's being said here. She doesn't defend anybody else, but the moment that, I can't remember if it's Bella or Snape, but one of them says something about Lucius having been caught and he's in jail. Like, Bellatrix is like, it's not my fault, Snape is sort of like, meh, and Narcissa is like, right away, hey, don't don't go just placing all the blame on my husband because he's not here. Like, she's really angry about that accusation, even towards somebody like her sister. And we see that she is... she's a mother. She is concerned about what position her son has been placed in. And she's aware of why he's been placed in this situation. It's not because he's expected to succeed. It's because he's expected to fail. 
and die because Lucius made mistakes. Narcissa, as a mother, actually places her family before the Dark Lord and seeks help to ensure that her family survives. And in fact, that point is going to be quintessential for the survival of Harry and the defeat of Voldemort in the last book. It is Narcissa's love as a mother that becomes a turning point, which actually reflects her with Lily Potter. And we've got mothers who are willing to sacrifice everything for their sons. Very much so, Narcissa is having difficulty with it, but she is sure that she would go against Lord Voldemort if it meant that her son could be safe. Even when her sister Bella is telling her not to, and even Snape tells her not to, like, she is sitting there weeping. Like, this is the only chance I have. And even pushes it sort of beyond just asking for help, like, she guarantees that Draco is going to have some help from Severus. Like, unbreakable vow right here. And that is something that we haven't seen from somebody on the, the Death Eater side of things. But Narcissa is just like, it makes of, uh, us, of course, very suspicious of Draco moving forward, uh, trying to figure out what he's been asked to do, and of course, he's been asked to kill Dumbledore. Um, which is just not gonna happen. We're aware of it. They're all aware of it. Um, but it means also that we should, as readers, remember that Draco has been forced into this position as a punishment and he's expected to fail. We should not get sort of taken with Harry's opinion that Draco's just doing this because he's a terrible person. No, it's, it's very much that we have been informed that this is a very nuanced, layered thing. And we can't just say Draco is a terrible person. Just as we can't actually say that his mother is a terrible person. She's a mother trying to protect her child. Even if that means going against uh, the Dark Lord. Snape <laughs> continues to just be an anomaly among everything. Um, Bellatrix, of course, believing him to be a spy for Voldemort. Uh, a spy for Dumbledore. He's claiming he's a spy for Voldemort, and Dumbledore just thinks he's a spy for Dumbledore. We know, of course, that he's playing both sides. So it becomes a question of... And I think we'll have an opportunity to explore this a little more when we get to the final book and we get some of Snape's memories. Um, but right here, right now, I'm just gonna say it. As far as I believe Snape's loyalties lie, for the most part, I believe that Snape is loyal to himself. And that he is legitimately willing to play both sides to achieve what he feels he wants. Um, whether or not that's to fit in with the other Slytherins, which originally led him to the Dark Arts, to uh, admitting what he did to Dumbledore, to save Lily, notably Lily, to taking this position because it means he's comfortable, it gives him a place where he can play both sides uh, at Hogwarts. There are moments of time where we can see that he is leaning towards the side of the good, but I think for the most part that's simply in revenge for the fact that uh, it was Voldemort who killed Lily and not Dumbledore or any of his people. Like I said, I think we'll have an opportunity to explore it a little more when we get those memories uh, and we get a bigger picture of the story. But in this moment, we really do see the way that he can sort of, as Bella points out, sort of snake his way through. And it's only through 
sort of her goading, but also because he's aware that Dumbledore is already dying, that he makes the unbreakable vow to, vow to help Draco. So, we, <coughs> we gotta watch Snape. <coughs> Snape is a quintessential Slytherin. Um, unfortunately, I think towards the negative side. Um, I know we paint Slytherins very negatively, and I don't think we necessarily should. There are certainly a lot of positive Slytherins. Um, Canon-wise, Merlin was a Slytherin. So... But Severus grew up in an abusive relation, in a, a abusive home, and uh, went through his school life very bullied. I think really he's learned to protect himself, and um, I'm not sure we can expect him to change. So I think we should sort of celebrate the moments where he does go a little beyond that self-protection to achieve positive aims. But in the long run, I don't think his aims are necessarily as noble as Narcissa, who's trying to protect her family. And then <laughs> we end up in uh, with Harry getting picked up from Dumbledore. Harry hasn't packed because he honestly doubts that Dumbledore will actually arrive. And that straight up informs you that the, the good side is in a lot of ways just as fractured as, as the Death Eater side. That Harry now has these doubts uh, and they are informing the actions that he takes. Like, and really, Dumbledore calls him on it. Like, Dumbledore really does directly say, like, you weren't expecting me to come. Uh, and I think that shows that maybe the, the Order of the Phoenix side of things is going to be a little better put together simply because Dumbledore can recognize the doubts that are there and, and start trying to address them. And I think he does try and address these doubts by asking Harry, like giving Harry a mission. But we should keep in mind, of course, that this then plays Harry and Draco off of each other that they've both been given these missions. But Dumbledore is hoping for Harry to succeed, and he's not giving him an, a mission that will likely get him killed if he fails. Yet. Yet. At, at the end of the book, and then the entire seventh book, that certainly changes, but of the initial mission that we're going to see, we're, we're gonna we're going to get to that point. The next mm, obvious question, sorry, uh, of loyalty is, of course, when we have to address the issue of Crutcher, who wants very much to be loyal to Bellatrix. And we know that this is because, like, Sirius was a good person. Regulus, who was a Death Eater, was actually very kind to Crutcher um, and treated him very well. And we get a feeling that blah 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 blah. Sirius and Regulus's mother, I know it starts with a war, and I'm just not going to be able to get it all, is um, also treated him relatively well. Uh, though we do have this frightening wall of elf heads to be concerned about. But that's sort of it. Dumbledore starts sort of pushing Harry towards that be kind rather than be angry side of things. Um, when he very logically points out that we can't just dismiss Crutcher, but we should maybe move him to a better situation than what he is now. Uh, and Crutcher's situation is very similar to Sirius's, where, again, you're by yourself in a place that maybe has 
for more crutch or some good memories, but it certainly got bad memories too. Um, alone, just doing and slowly just going insane. So instead, we're gonna we're gonna move him and retain him, but it's still this moment sort of 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 watching even our own side crack and and strain under the pressure. The final one I would like to talk about is the oddness of, of Dumbledore here, um, where we get the... we get the idea that as good as Dumbledore is, he is not perfect in a different way than we've gotten it before. Uh, we've looked at Dumbledore saying he's made some decisions He's made some choices that aren't perfect, things like that. Uh, this moment is on a smaller scale and we actually kind of find it funny, where Dumbledore is literally very directly talking about the, these niceties that everyone's supposed to be playing at. Let's act like you've invited me in. Let's act like you've invited me to the sitting room. Let's act like you've offered me a drink. But that's the thing, and insofar as the Dursleys are being rude, you can say that Dumbledore also is, uh, because he is not respecting their boundaries, their property, and their opinions. He's overriding them simply because he can. Um, and he might have bigger reasons for it, like we've got these things to discuss. But it's still rudeness. Especially, you know, bouncing the drinks off the Dursley's head. He says it would be politer if he had drunk. It might have been politer if he hadn't tried to force them to by bouncing glasses off their heads and showing off that you are magic, they are not, and you have power, and they don't. It, it concerns me a little bit. So I just want to keep that in mind going forward. Quick thing, sort of to add on here, at the end of this chapter we do find out that 17 is the age of adulthood, coming of age for wizards versus the 18 of muggles. So we should keep in mind not 17 necessarily, but 7 as the magical number and just what that might be related to, because it's important that it's been mentioned here uh, very specifically that it is different from the Muggle version. It's not just setting up the start of Deathly Hollows, but the, the number is quintessential in and of itself, and we should keep that in mind. Okay, we're on a roll. We're gonna do this. I'm gonna keep reading, and I hope you do too. See you next time.